Well, you're going to love this conversation today because it's just going to inspire you. And we're talking today with Julie Angel, who is a movement coach, but she's also an artist and a filmmaker and an author. Well, she's actually even more than that, but we have to stop somewhere. <laughs> so, but what's really cool about her is that she is the first person in the world, at least that I know of, who has a PhD in parkour. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry, we'll explain it later. And because she fell in love with parkour, she also learned to move with grace and with strength from some of the best teachers and coaches in different movement worlds. And you'll see, well, um, actually you're gonna hear that she's an optimist and how she can help us women in midlife break free from this negative cycle of extreme workouts and fat diets and anxiety and injuries so that we can all find strength and balance that will stick with us for the rest of our lives. And, and I'm not kidding. I've seen some of her posts on normal women in their seventies on a trapeze. <laughs> and if you check out her website, see and do, you'll see that she has her own programs and videos that show how we can all use what she calls things like movement snacks and strong resting, positive aging, and all these other tools from parkour and natural movement. And even my favorite breath work to help people really connect with their strong bodies and their strong minds. And we all have it within us. And she insists also, this is super important that it has to be fun and it has to feel good. So I'm really excited to share this energy with you. And without further ado, meet Julie. Welcome. Thank you. What an intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm super excited. I first heard you on Celine Yeager's podcast, Hit Play, Not Pause. And I just was blown away with what you said. I just fell in love with you. And I, I love the message that you have. And before we jump into it, I really want you to explain what parkour is. I know people are just kind of going, what is that? So what is it and how did you get interested in it? Sure. So parkour is um, a a kind of methodology and a discipline for overcoming obstacles. It was created by a group of friends in France on the outskirts of Paris, so not the city of lights. We're talking about the banlieues, uh, a very different environment. And it's basically how, so you, a lot of people have seen like every action film stunt sequence now has parkour in it. I can literally recognize some of the stunt doubles. Um, a lot of my female friends who are professional parkour athletes now are the stunt women in Wonder Woman, in um, Star Wars. And it's like, oh, that's Fizz. Oh, that's Katie. Oh, that's Andrea being Supergirl. Or, um, so a lot of people know the kind of spectacular side of parkour, which is this kind of the, the parkour that's used for commercials. So, you know, kind of roof jumpers and free running and, oh, they're the people who are really good at Ninja Warrior these days. Hmm. Um, but at, it, at its heart, parkour is, uh, on the physical side of it, is how to overcome obstacles. So how to get from A to B in any environment. So that could be in a forest, in um, when you're going, you're out on the trail or, when you're in a city, the urban furniture gets a lot more attention because we're moving in ways that people may not think are normal. So like, why is that person perched balancing on a railing or why are they vaulting over that wall? Um, and the reality of parkour is that it's um, there, is, there is this physical side to it and this methodology of overcoming obstacles. But for me, the real magic of parkour is the emotional introverted journey that happens because when you start to connect with the environment in this very tactile way, um, you get to see who you are in that moment. Because I can tell you when you're walking and balancing on a, a, a round railing, there's no time to think about the email or the conversation or the to-do list or all those other things. And so much of our lives, especially in midlife, we're pulled in so many different directions. The, the simple, yet not always easy, action of just being present and in the moment is something that I see has become more rare in the everyday busy lives of juggling responsibilities and all those things. So there's no room for anything else. So to be present in the moment, to engage in this very tactile sensory way with your environment, you connect with who you are and the way that you imagine, you can reimagine the environment allows 
a, a doorway and a kind of treasure map for you to also reimagine who you are and what you can be. And you get to see who you are every single time on each different day, because we're not always the same where, you know, one day maybe you're, you're tired and you're like, oh, dragging your feet a little bit and a bit tentative and feeling vulnerable. And another day you're like, oh my God, like seize the day. Um, and you're all of those things all of the time. So, um, so yeah, parkour is uh, at the elite level, it's very dynamic and people are, what, what's really stunning and what was very beautiful to me as a filmmaker to document was they've rewritten the, the rule book of well you can do this and not get hurt and the the first second the first and second generation it's still a very young discipline a very young practice and the first generation I mean the the oldest ones are now I think 47 48 and physically they're great I mean if you look at and also I have to say that when you watch videos of parkour on video it's it actually looks smaller than it is photographs make it look bigger and on video, it looks smaller. So when you go to some of those locations and you're like, oh my God, seriously, someone went like, they jumped from there to there or they climbed that and did that. You're just like, holy beep, beep, beep. <laughs> um, and, and to know that they did that and they were fine and they did tens and it, sometimes hundreds and sometimes thousands of repetitions of these things. So they have really um, moved the goalpost on what we believe is possible. And now as with the growth of any kind of movement practice, the, you know, the second and third generation have surpassed. They, they've had their journey expedited because once you can see someone do it, it's easier to do it. So they're, they're like taking it to whole new incredible levels. And it's just, I, I still see things now, um, which are like, just, wow. Yeah. Just, just, but for me, it's a very introverted practice. It's actually a contradiction because the movement side can be spectacular. My movement side is not spectacular in the slightest. And that's not a sense of humility. Like I do very small stuff. I'm scared of heights. I have no reason to go climbing up on big things. Um, but I can move dynamically and creatively in any environment, which means the world is a playground. I, I don't need a gym membership, nothing, nothing against gyms. I just don't personally have one right now and don't feel the need for one right now. Um, but the world's a playground and then you start to connect with it more. If you connect with your environment, then you can connect with who you are. So that's a very long and yeah, <laughs> flowy the explanation. No, of, it is. It is a great explanation. Happened. And I think if you, you know, people can get the visual, like you said, stuntmen. So what's the difference between a stuntman and, or stunt woman and somebody who's doing parkour? Well, number one is when you're doing parkour, it's your own individual practice and it has meaning to you and you do it on your terms, on your day. Um, you calculate your own risk. So there's a very, very low injury rate because nobody's sadistic. No, nobody, everyone wants to care about, well, you know, how can I train tomorrow? How can I move tomorrow? What can I do tomorrow? Whereas, um, and I've worked on films, so when you're a stuntman, you're, you're agreeing to do something. It's a contract in exchange for financial exchange for, you know, the, you know, the production, they need to get their pound of flesh at the end of the day. They bring in safety people, they'll bring in ropes, they'll bring in nets, um, all of those things. But the day-to-day -day parkour is number one, it's normally a lot smaller. Um, it's more individual calculated, risk and there's a huge difference between risk and danger Matt, like that's a whole other discussion in and of itself um and like I said it could be someone like you could see a kid out in the playground or like when I was a kid uh we used to walk at remember like Saturday afternoon have to you know if my mom was going into town and we'd be walking along and there was this little wall on the left hand side and this one kind of place that we'd always walk through and I always just wanted to jump up on the wall and walk along the wall. It was far more interesting than walking on the pavement or, or sidewalk. Of course. And like, <laughs> you know, it's so like all kids are doing parkour all the time. They, they haven't been socialized. They haven't had this, like, I'm telling you what's normal. And this is how you should move in this place. And you should only move on things that were designed for movement, which mm -hmm. for me is just like, well, well, that's boring and that's limiting and that's oppressive. Mm -hmm. And who gets to say what's normal? So even the clothes we wear sometimes, if I go out and I'm, I'm moving, and this happens to female friends all the time. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm in my sports uniform, if I'm wearing sporting clothing, it's a little bit more accepted. 
in some of the movement things I do. If I'm wearing like my silk shirt and my baggy trousers, um, people are like, are you, are you okay? Or they, it, it could be alarming. <laughs> Excuse me, you're not, you're not allowed to do that. I've been stopped so many times. Like you're not allowed to do that, but you can do that if you go and join that club and you, you're allowed to do it at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday night. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I want to do it on a Thursday at three o'clock in the afternoon. It's yeah. park. Let me play. Yeah, I love it. I love the sense of play that you bring in. And and it really resonated with me. I mean, I was the kid who, you know, in, in the house, you know, you have a, a narrow wall and I would do the Spider-Man oh, nice. thing and climb up yes. and see how I could get, you know, yeah. in Santa Monica, that big rope, you know, that people climb. Yes. You know, I just, yeah. I love doing that. And and I'm like, you just, I, I would rather walk on the upper part of, you know, some railing rather than, not, not a narrow railing because I'm not that advanced, but, you know, just more fun to to do that. And I've always, and I've, I'm still like that. And I, but I, I've been for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, like repressing this, like, okay, mm -hmm. I know it's not socially acceptable, but sometimes I just can't resist. You know, I see a, a grass field and I just want to do a cartwheel. <laughs> like, I just, yeah. I mean, I just do it. It's but, permission to play. Yeah. You are giving us the permission to play. And I just wish, you know, we'd have more people like that because I do look like an orangutan and um, just <laughs> sometimes just swinging over my husband's going, Oh my God, here she goes again. But it's part of me. I just want to play. And, and it's, and it's lo lovely to see how far can I push my body? Like where, what are the limits? Or like, can I hang on that thing? How long can I hang on that thing? You know, if I fail, I fail. Or if I just, do, I doesn't, I don't even think about it. You just go, let's just see what happens. And so uh, what everything you're doing, when I've watched some of your videos and I'm like, oh, it's great. When I meet you, you and I are just gonna be jumping over rails. Oh yeah, swinging we'll on the trees. <laughs> It'll be, it'll be fun. It'll be, and, it'll be fun. Definitely. And you're, you're 50 or 49. How old are you? 52. You're 52. Okay. So just like me, I'll be in a couple months, 52. So, you know, you don't see a lot of 52 year old women uh, doing this or men or adults. So it's not, you know, you accept it in a child. And even then you may go, oh, you know, you know, like you said, these are not social norms. So we'd stop our kids from doing it, but I'm sorry, I'm with you and let's, let's play. And um, so how did then, did you get into uh, the becoming a movement coach from the parkour? How did that transition happen? So my background is in creative industries. So I trained as a filmmaker and an artist and I, and I still am. I, I wear many hats in my life. And um, I basically, I was filming parkour as part of a practice-based PhD where you basically got to be kind of the filmmaker and then you would still do this dissertation at the end. And prior to that, I'd actually been in Southern California. Sorry, can you hear my dog crying? <laughs> Sorry, Frank, hang on. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd been in Southern California making a, a film with a friend of mine, um, the film documentary called Chlorine, which is about pool skaters. So people who find empty swimming pools or drainage pipes and then clean them and skate in them. And so that was my first sort of intro to people using the environment in more creative, imaginative, physical, unregulated ways. And then I was back in the UK and then parkour started to appear. This was in sort of 2003, 2002, 2003. And then I started doing some visual anthropology evening classes in London. And I realized like, oh, that's, that's the name. That's how I approach filmmaking. That's this collaborative feedback, long-term project where I never say I'm the expert. I always work with people and then say like, well, what, what matters to you? I can do the framing and the editing, but in terms of translating meaning so that I can understand someone else's world and communicate that in a way that someone who's in neither of our worlds can gain some insight into. Um, so I was kind of already on this sort of, so imagination, reimagining the environment, creative and physical and urban, because I'd, I'd grown up in the Southwest of England. I was always like running around on the moors. It was the most natural thing to do, but put into a, a cityscape, it was very different. So I started filming the, the parkour athletes who were in London at the time. And I had no intention of doing parkour. I was, I was very clear, like, hi, my name's Julie. I'm an artist and a filmmaker. Boom. And I travel and I'm independent and da, 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 da. 
And, but when you're around people who move all the time, it makes you want to move. But I was also at least 20 years older than everyone else. And um, before there was a class there, I think I'd seen only like one or two other women doing it. So I was very, a very kind of marginal minority in it. And then they, um, and the people I was filming, they, they were always encouraging. They were, oh, come on, Julie, you should try it. And I'd be like, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. And it wasn't so much, oh, I'll get injured because I saw the scale of parkour. So I saw, you know, people pay, playing on the pavement, people doing like tiny, tiny things that I was very capable of, even as someone who'd been sat down for 20 years. Um, but I just, I didn't want to lose face. It was more, I didn't want to make an ass of myself. I, like I had a certain credibility amongst my research participants in my filmmaker hat and to, to risk my kind of credibility and, and to basically show vulnerability was something that took six months for me to get over myself. And also they, and it wasn't until a class was offered and it, it wasn't until one of the, the participants who, who actually had a background as a personal coach and a trainer. And I trusted him to guide me because the, the rest of them were just, they, they were, you know, self-taught natural athletes, kids who were like guys who were 19. I'm like, you have no idea what to do with a 35 year old woman at the time. <laughs> like you, like, like you, you're just working this out for yourself. Um, and so I just started to move and move really slowly. And it was a shock to the system. I don't think I've ever in my life had such whole body aches and pain. Like <laughs> my entry into parkour was brutal. And things have evolved since there. So you can go to a parkour class and not have this uh, kind of thing or experience afterwards. But also I try it cherish and treasure all of those early crazy days um, as well because there is there's kind of something incredible about a pedagogy where someone just says follow me find a way mm -hmm. and like you know sometimes other people are like well show me this te technique and this thing and I'm like stop thinking don't overthink it your body your story find a way so mm -hmm. there's, there's a place for all of these kind of different approaches and then so I became someone who was a filmmaker but once I started to embody the movements, that changed how I represented the movements because I could then embody and have this different physical empathy and feeling and experience. And then that also brought me in touch with these other kind of natural movement worlds as well. And then I became this kind of insider outsider where some of those people, if they were looking for videos or stuff like that, I was trusted. I had a kind of trusted eye and a trusted empathy and, and I cared about, you know, okay, we could show this on, on film, but I care if you feel good tomorrow, where I was, I've been on shoots for commercials and to, to say it harshly, I mean, as long as the people get the shot, they really don't give a shit if you're, if you can walk tomorrow, like they got their pound of flesh, they paid you a lot of money. Here's the deal. This was our contract. You agreed to it. I don't care if you're tired. I don't care if you're carrying that injury. This is the pictures we want. And that, that's the reality of that industry. Um, so most of the time, so when I was brought in, I could kind of speak both languages. I could speak advertising, media, commercial shoots, and I could speak the, the movement training um, of that as well. So, and then I ended up, yeah, just exposed to more movement. It just got wider and then it got more holistic. And then it, it brought in other methodologies, which all complemented each other and then they became more holistic and then it was like well wow like okay those 19 year old guys who like they do all this amazing movement but then like they'll go to the supermarket and buy the shittiest sandwich and like eat the most horrible food and I'm like I'm just not prepared <laughs> to do that <laughs> and then you start playing with the recovery side of what you know what I now like term strong resting and now and then you also have the mindset side and then you have all these other things. So it just, it just grew very, like there was no plan. There was, and even for me, it was a really kind of big thing. And, and I think had I not gone through the, the parkour experiences at the beginning to, to suddenly, you know, when, you know, when you're like 48 or 49, you go, oh, hi, my name's Julie, I'm a movement coach. When for all your adult life, you've been going, hi, my name's Julie, I'm an artist and a filmmaker. It's like, 
you know, you have imposter syndrome, you have all this stuff going on, you have all these ideas, and then you're like, do you know what? I am, I'm, I'm an academic, I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm a movement coach, I'm a dog walker, I'm a gardener, I'm a clown, I'm an asshole, I'm like, I'm on the whole, I'm the whole shebang. And I've never met anyone who's, so my identity is not tied into just one thing. Um, I think my, my ego is, is firmly in the creative world, which has meant my movement practice is so free mm. and it's not tied into it. And I've been close to so many people who, um, who, have, who have reached the elite level earlier in life. And for them, their why and their meaning behind their movement is a different journey than for those of us who um, find movement at different moments and at different times. And also I have no expectation and I'm, I'm not in a rush. And, you know, it took like five years for me to vault dynamically over anything. And the first time I did, I remember one of the coaches was like, oh, do you know you did that thing? I was like, I oh, know, oh my God. Um, and, you know, we can build muscle up until age 98 according to the science so none of us are that special we're like well if you do this thing you have continuity you learn to recover you balance all this stuff then I'm, I'm sorry but you're not that special that you can't create change that transformation is not possible for you possible is one thing easy no you need support you need accountability and you know people have tried many many things so some people think like you know, I get emails from people. I got, I got one from a lady this morning saying, I'm so out of shape. Please be gentle with me. Like I'm in terrible shape and I haven't worked out and da, da, da. And I'm like, well, no. I mean, working out is something I don't really kind of align with. I don't really align with the word exercise because I'm just a, a bit of a hedonist, really. Like if it doesn't feel good, I'm not motivated to do it. And I, or I can do, I can do anything for a short amount of time, as can most women. Like we're Women can push through. Women can juggle. Women can multitask. Women are just flipping amazing. And, but the long-term care of ourselves, getting in our own way, the, the asshole who lives in your head and talks shit to you about you, that's where a lot of the work needs to happen. And then the support of like, well, what's sustainable in our lives? And then are you changing with the changes or are you expecting to be able to do the things you did maybe two years ago, maybe five years ago, maybe 15 years ago. And you're like, oh, nothing works for me. And it's like, well, let's have a look at that. Like you're, you're, you're not like not the, the cells in your body are literally not the same <laughs> as they were seven <laughs> years ago. So let alone, you know, bring in hormones and mindset. And what have you gone through in life? Maybe you've had some trauma, maybe, you know, like by the time you get to like our ages, like you've lived something you know Absolutely. and um so it's a process it's it's a journey and, and we don't I mean I'm I'm very lucky that I I do see a lot of women in their 40s 50s 60s doing really great movement and um so for me it's become normalized and that's what I want to share and that sense of possibility and that's where kind of you know, positive aging meets parkour, meets play, e even, you know, the science behind, well, that's neuroplasticity, like, give me a, show me a dancer, and it's like, they're creating new movement patterns, their movement library is, is phenomenal, but, you know, what they do and what I do, we, it can look completely differently, but it's kind of same, same, but different. Yeah, you know, it's it's that it's the same pathways, right? I mean, there's that's what we we want to 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 carve out. And as we age, you know, so what you're doing is not only about the physical. There's a lot of mental and spiritual and creativity and all this stuff. So that's right. I, I think it's really interesting. And and anyone who works with you can in a pre can appreciate like you are kind of a pioneer in this in this field because you know, like you said, the, 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 the true pioneers were the guys who were, you know, just experimenting and they had no idea how far they could go. And now that we can see them and we have, we know what they can do. We're inspired. At least we know, but there's no one taking that space as an older woman who can understand the issues of an older woman and, and, and maybe some of the fears, some of the, the background and the hormones and all this, this garbage that maybe we'd be carrying that a, a 19 year old boy is just not dealing with. So yeah, and even the, the coaches, the male coaches have no idea. Yeah. Like the, a lot of, a lot of male doctors have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. 
code you know when you kind of then narrow it down then you're like okay well the like we're talking about health professionals now we're talking about coaches now we're talking about a niche now we're going to a super niche now we're talking about the minority within the super niche of the super niche yeah and um and also you know the the background of someone like so i i my, my friend kiko is um is 60 or 61 now and she moves like a 25 year old guy and she has like 30 40 years of kung fu in her background uh people who've done gymnastics as a kid are going to have a different like it changes if you've done like years of gymnastics up to age 16 your your starting line is different 100 mm -hmm. yet you know i i i was i was the classic active teenage girl up until age 16 then i stopped so I'd been I'd been sat down for a long time. If you're you know if you're carrying a lot of excess weight, but the whole point is that things like parkour and natural movement for me they're a culture of effort, and this inner journey is something that um, like you can't see effort a lot of the time unless you know you have someone's like grimacing face or you know the scream or. But I always say to people like showing up is the hardest thing you'll ever have to do if it's at a workshop or, or a session or, or something like that. Um, and it's this this inner work. And so we haven't even seen yet. So like the younger women who are coming through parkour now, it's like we don't even know what's possible for women's bodies. This is like it's a very exciting time. This kind of age of athleticism is just amazing to kind of to witness and then also so some of the um i mean i'm i'm really i'm not interested in the elites for me like they have enough people to take care of themselves they can take care of themselves i'm not and what i care about is like the other 99.9999999999% of the population who um who want to have enough energy in the tank for for life it's like i'm i'm not interested in in, you know, I'll have my own kind of movement projects and I'll have my own things, um, but I want to wake up. It's a very health first approach to movement and there is no separation of mind and body like for anyone. If, if you're still thinking it's one or the other all the way. Like, please just go back to the dark ages. Like, have we not moved on from there? Like, <laughs> like it's, it's just phenomenal. Um, and there's so much now of the, the kind of, and for all the kind of science geeks, there's a lot of stuff now where we can really verify the neuroscience on it of, well, you know, the, there's all the, the kind of studies that show um, the, there was one test where they had a group of people walking and then they were subliminal, there were subliminal words that were presented in front of them of um, senior, frail, um, senile, aged. And as soon as those subliminal messages came up, their posture changed for the worse. Mm -hmm. So th this is where like the positive aging comes in. Um, the work of Dr. Ellen Langer on reframing aging um, is phenomenal the work that Ali Crum's doing even now like the science blows my mind on the your mindset towards the food you eat can change the nutritional uh, function of what that food does in your body which is like what yeah I've what? heard of that that's it's, it's your wild. mind is super powerful but I wanna you, you talked a little bit about frailty and and mm -hmm. you know as a gerontologist this is a huge issue that we talk about and actually just the last lecture was all about falls and uh and how to you know fall prevention and you know it's you know being fra frail is one of the biggest contributor to disability and falls in older age and and especially in women and mm -hmm. then it's often followed by hip fractures mm -hmm. and just what's even more shocking is that one in three women will have a hip fracture in their lifetime and most of them are happening after the age of 65 and then women are five times more likely to die within the three months of the hip fracture and that's all because of frailty and maybe osteoporosis and things. So it's all avoidable. And, mm -hmm. but, you know, we got to start now, like, let's not wait a moment. So, you know, what you're doing is movement, agility, flexibility, strength, all of these are super important as we age. So even though you may say, okay, this is a very niche, you know, okay, we say parkour, it's, it is so 
broad and so important to the majority of the population that's aging. And of course, our population is aging at a very fast rate that, you know, this is one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on here is to be able to help people who, you know, were women over 50 get into movement. It's never too late. And, and, and how important that is, you know, we, we always hear of the person, you know, throwing out their back when they make the bed or, you know, they, they injure their hips, you know, when they're just tying their shoe or something stupid or just fall. Like this is, you know, in parkour, you learn how to fall, right? There's so many things that, that you can teach as a movement coach and so many things that we can learn. And I, I really wanted to stress the importance of this It's not just let's, you know, have some movement and feel good. You know, it's, it's really vital to your health, your aging, your longevity, how long you'll live. Right. So, you know, what do you think um, it, that we need for a strong body? For example, like wh what would you say is a good place to start for someone who's, who's a woman over 50? Mm -hmm. Sure. So what I'm, so everyone can do parkour, but parkour is not for everyone. That's, that's very clear. And so what I actually do, what I, I start with, with all my clients and what I re recommend for every adult in the world is movement snacks. So, and, and as you say, like with all these statistics, this is, this is a tragedy. This is just so much suffering and so much loss across so many spheres. It, it's really a great tragedy. And I think, uh, so I believe in this philosophy that when you do a little thing over a long period of time, you get a huge reward. And that reward is strength, range of motion, confidence, happiness, at ease, less tension. And so the more worried you are about falling, there's a 70% higher chance that you will fall. <laughs> so if you walk around your, your day like going, Oh my God, I'm worried about falling. I'm worried about falling. I'm worried about falling. I'm worried about falling. All your mind hears is fall, <laughs> fall, <laughs> fall. <laughs> and, and yet it's a very legitimate concern. So we are, are a neuromuscular use it or lose it system. And a lot of people say, well, is it too late? I don't know where to start. Um, like I said, every, you know, so many women uh, walk around with this, like, I'm in terrible shape, I'm da, 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 so what can I do? So for me, like making something harder, giving someone a hard workout is like, it's a piece of cake. There's no, like to make something more complex is, is something anyone in the world can do. Um, but I think to get someone having this mindset shift of recognizing that, are you serious that like, one to five minutes or five to 10 minutes every day of something that's not going to feel really difficult is actually going to make me strong. And I'm like, yes, 100%. So there, there's this paradigm shift of moving away from no pain, no gain. Like, I hate that so much. Like, I, I would swear so badly on you. <laughs> you can, it's okay. I won't. Like, the yeah. these stupid <laughs> um, so no pain no gain I have no interest in that none zero it's not sustainable and it's not um, yes a little bit of what stresses you and what doesn't kill you will make you stronger but what that little bit is can look a thousand different ways for a thousand different people but the movement snacks approach is this paradigm shift that it doesn't have to be all or nothing so people think well if I do you know I've, I've set myself this goal and, and I'll do this and then they're like well I missed yesterday and then I got caught up with that and I didn't have time for that and I'm too tired for that so they think well it's not worth it and those days where you just do one thing those days where you have like a one percent day or a ten percent day are going to make huge, huge, huge change in your life. And the, the challenge is that when something is so small and so accessible, as easy it is, as it is to do, it's easy to not do mm -hmm. because you're not of the mindset because society doesn't promote a mindset that says a little bit is going to make it, you know, a little, if you want to, a big change, you need to think really small. So movement snacks, is the gateway. Movement snacks are the doorway into number one, 
letting go of tension and taking you out of fight or flight. So being stuck in the sympathetic nervous system where I know, you know, you're a breath coach. I'm, I'm all on board, like oxygen advantage. It's, it's, that's my gig. Um, because when you are stuck in fight or flight, you're living in this hypervigilant emergency mode. And the other paradigm shift that I have, that I, um, that I, I kind of, I'm like a broken record with um, is the more relaxed you are, the stronger you are. Because the amount of tension, the amount of energy that people spend carrying tension in their mind and in their body all day long is exhausting. And the other key is that movement begets more movement. So the first movements you do are going to set you up for how you feel of whether you want to do more movements. So my own personal approach to movement snacks is, so I'll start with these kind of nervous system resets. Um, where, so they always start with breath work Yay. because that just take <laughs> even just one minute of breath work is uh, enough to go oh here I am in the world <laughs> who am I what's happening today oh gosh wow just five more breaths let's yeah. just let's just ease and then from there I then do some other movements and there's a, a free movement snacks guide that your, your listeners yeah. can get. And I'm, I'm sure that'll all be in the show notes and things. Um, so then things like rocking, head nods, rolls that will then tell my body, how, how am I? And you can actually get honest feedback. So like, so a lot of people say like, I'm, I feel really stressed. Well, the body only produces one type of cortisol. It doesn't care what the origin of that stressor is. Are you nutritionally stressed? Are you emotionally stressed? Are you financially stressed? Are you physically stressed? So a lot of people feel very tired, but it's like, well, what kind of tired are you? Are you like lazy, can't be asked tired? Are you anxiety tired? Are you physiologically cellular tired? Are you, but when you go into the movement snacks, you have, you have honest feedback. And you're doing them at a pace where you can, there's time to listen. And this listening to your body and then being able to answer your needs and having the tools to meet those needs. So some days I'll like, I'll start with my movement snacks and I'll be like, okay, I'm good. That's it, mm -hmm. five minutes. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I am very tired today or this isn't the day and I mean I walk every day that's another like that's one of the most basic kind of nervous system resets you can do is this contralateral pattern of walking and I, I have a large dog and we walk an hour and a half a day mm. and it, he actually had his annual vets checkup yesterday and he's a nine and a half year old dog and the vet said something which just filled my heart which she was like if I wasn't looking at this number like on his chart she was like he's a four to five year old dog Wow. His health is at four to five year old. And so we, she was like, what, what do you feed him? How do you exercise? And I said, we're, we're very gentle. I have never, ever taken my dog out and said, I want to tire him out hmm. ever. And I see people, they go out and I know people have busy lives and I'm, I'm not like bashing other dog, <laughs> dog owners, but I see people all the time who go out and they take a ball and they just want their dog to sprint non-stop for 20 minutes and then they won't take the dog out for the rest of the day or do anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then I see those dogs age and they go oh yeah they've got their back legs are gone or this is gone and I'm like so it was very intent it's very intentional how we move like how mm -hmm. we hike how we like you walk and walk and walk and then like there's these occasional outbursts of mm -hmm. intensity of mm -hmm. and they're the sweet spot of good stress so not all stress is bad stress either. We have the sweet spot of good stress and, and bad stress. So, so yeah, so going back to the movement snack, so they allow me or anyone who does them to meet yourself where you're at in that moment, in that day. Mm -hmm. Every day is different. It's never the same. Do you have the tools, the knowledge, the account and the support to meet yourself where you're at every single day? So some days I'll do my movement snacks and then I'll be like, oh, wow, yeah, I'm going to go do some handstand practices or I'm going to go surfing or I'm going to um, do some kettlebells or I'm going to do, do whatever I choose to do, like go play on the railings or like I'll, whatever I choose to do. And other days I'm just like, 
no, that's good. I'm good. Mm -hmm. But there is a continuity and that's where the magic happens. So everyone can get stronger. Everyone can change their range of motion, their ease, because everyone has the capacity to let go of tension that doesn't serve them. And then to be able to recruit tension in the body where it does. So a lot of people have, uh, I meet a lot of people who are very strong. Maybe they have a lot of movement backgrounds and yet their body is disconnected. It's mm. not working in, in their whole thing. So um, uh, I was saying before we started recording, I had like a, a beautiful testimonial from a client who's just finished my 12 week program yesterday, Narina, Dr. Narina. And um, she, so when we started, you know, she was wearing a knee brace um you know her doctor told her like well you're all, you're gonna have to always wear that for the support and for this and that and I have so many friends who are her movers who are told like well you know you kind of think yourself lucky you can walk you're never going to be doing this again <laughs> yeah. and it's like well so number one if you're someone who enjoys movement you have no idea what someone's prepared to do to explore mm -hmm. their movement recover their movement and um lost my train of thought what was I saying what the testimonial sorry. Yeah, so, um, yeah, no, so Narina had all these kind of strengths. So, you know, she's run ultra marathons. She's 57, 58. Um, she could do like nine pull-ups. She could, just, but she couldn't do, or, she, or it was challenging for her at the beginning, some of the movement snacks. Celine Yeager on hip play, not pause. She, you know, this celebrated, you know, triathlete endurance woman, amazing. She was like, they're kind of sneaky harsh. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but I can't get up and up and down from the floor with these in, in, in this particular way. And it's like, yeah. that's where the connection needs the rewiring. So for Narina, doing these other things where she had to slow down, speed heights need. Mm -hmm. So she had to slow down and let go of tension and then do these things. And now she's like, oh, now my body is reconnected. Yeah. And now I'm not in pain. And now I don't have to wear a brace and now, and she's climbing stronger than she's ever climbed. She's, and, but again, it's this emotional ease with a physical ease. And when you start to feel more connected in your body, when you start to let go of tension that doesn't serve you, when you start to feel these gains, these, these gains, and it, it can be like, so I, I also work with women who, a lot of women who, haven't moved for a very long time or they've had injuries or they've had car accidents and things like that. And, and they create like, a fear oh. as well. Once you have an accident, yeah. your, your brain is re rewired to have fear of certain yeah. movements, right? So our body is always protecting us, always 24 seven. And to be able to kind of go into this state of number one, it's very difficult to get stronger unless your body feels safe. So the movement snacks and have this very intentional nervous system reset behind them to put you in a position of safety. Because once your body feels safe, then you can start to do these tiny moves. And then you're, when what you're doing is you're telling your body, like, see, nothing bad happens when we go there. Mm -hmm. Nothing bad happens when we go there. And you're doing a repetition of this in a very safe, scalable amount every day. Yeah. And then it's kind of like, you, you know, we're our own ecosystem. It's like you have a garden and you go, like, someone comes in and they go like, oh God, yeah, but there's no nutrients in the soil. Okay, let's, let's work on the soil. Then, oh, but now you don't water it. Okay, let's work on the watering. Okay, then let's plant these things. And even if you, you're not gonna see anything tomorrow, there's no silver bullet. Your flower is not gonna be in bloom yet, but just keep going out there every day and do this and do this. And then suddenly like, within a period of one to two weeks, you're like, oh my God, this plant is now like seven inches tall and there's this beautiful flower on it. And it's like, yes. So we can't always see and feel the changes. And so, you know, there's a lot of delayed gratification that's involved in creating a sustainable movement culture for you and also, the kind of movements that you feel joy in are individual to you. And so I also help guide people to finding out how to create their own sustainable movement culture. Like I have mine. 
that's my story and my business and my body. Like you may have similarities with me, but that's irrelevant. What I care about is can you create your own movement culture that's going to work for you? And when we start to let go of that tension, when we start to be at more ease, when we start to feel more safe, we also start to sleep better, then our mindset start, set starts to change. And then, and you can't also get stronger unless you're working on nutrition. Like it's just, yeah. otherwise it's, you, you cannot exercise out a bad diet. It, people would feel it was very convenient if they could. I, I know people who they eat shit all the time, go kill themselves at the gym. And they wonder why they wake up feeling shitty and they have aches and pains and the future is not going to be bright. And they'll be like, I don't understand it because I go like five times a week and I do this and I do that. <laughs> and like, yeah. But you're, it's like, you're taking that garden and you're, you're putting toxins in it every so, single day. So you're be. also guiding a little on, on the nutrition side as well for your clients. On a very, very foundational, simple way. And mm-hmm. what I've done with my course is I've brought in my coaches so the people who've helped me are also going to help people who work with me. So um, my friend, Jared Tavasolian, he's a nutritionist and health coach. And he's one of those rare elites who cares about the 900, <laughs> like yeah, all, the, all the rest of us. And, um, and I kind of like, I don't bring anyone in who I haven't worked with and who I know that it works. So I went through, you know, Jared guided me through perimenopause. I'm now in menopause. And, uh, and I, I've seen how it, how it works for, for other people. And I also know like what it means to go through this big paradigm shift of you're like, but I thought paleo, but I felt amazing on paleo for five, seven years. And now why is it, why do I wake up crying and anxiety? And I feel like the tin man and all my joints ache. And it's like, well, it's not <laughs> imbalance. And you've, you know, there's, so it's really about finding balance. It's about just being aware of like, what are the red flags? So like any, any woman who's in their forties or fifties. So like a few, a few like tips would be, I'm like, if you have caffeine before food or without food, like before food, like put a gun to your head and feel more stressed. Like it's just, it's <laughs> this just is what 90% caffeine. of the population does is anyways, right. I they know, wake up and, it, and they have a cup of coffee, right. Before anything mind. else blows my mind and so I used to be I used to wake up and have like two cups of like proper English black tea you know tea with milk like I would wake up not hungry have two cups of tea and then wait until so I'd wake up at six or seven and then I'd wait until 10 to eat and like and be a mess Mm -hmm. but I always thought like oh well you know it's called intermittent I'm not fasting. I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to get fat if I don't eat, like I don't start my day eating until 10. Like how good am I? Brownie points, discipline, started the day strong. Yeah. And then you're like, yeah, how's well, that working out for you? Yeah. <laughs> interesting. So I'm, I'm, tell me, yeah, tell I'm me then. Nutritionist. Yeah. No, I know it's interesting. No, but it's, it's a part of your program, which is yeah. very important. Part of strong resting. Yeah. So how you mentioned uh, you menopause. So you have yeah. already passed through menopause. So how has your movement changed, if at all, or because of the transition in the, in your hormones and how, what have you done to, to fix anything that's been going wrong, or maybe it hasn't at all, or what, where, what's it like for you? So when I was in perimenopause, I was overtraining and under eating. Mm, great. <laughs> So it's like, yay! Yeah, That's like why I was great. People. Yeah. So I had a lot of tears and a lot of anxiety and injuries that didn't heal. And then I just thought, oh, I'm all in rubbish. Which and is horrifying for, you know, someone who does like to move. Like whenever I get yeah. injured for, you know, the first time I got injured with my knee when I was 25 was skiing. I was like, I will never be able to walk again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will never be able to move again. I mean, yeah. it's, it's horrifying for yeah. somebody who really does like to move. So I can imagine how devastating it was for you when you when you feel off yeah and also like I'm I'm not like I enjoy movement but I'm not like I'm not a kind of oh I've always moved and done loads of movement and loads of sport. I'm kind of a lazy ass as well like <laughs> I can I can like sit in a like lie in a hammock all day I can just go for walks I can like if I'm editing a project like unless my dog like notifies me every two hours like hey it's about time we went outside I, I can lose myself intellectually and creatively in projects for like four to six hours. I'm not, I'm not kind of, um, cause I do know people who are like, well, I've always moved and I'm like, 
no nah, mm-hmm. like I enjoy I enjoy it and I love it and I enjoy it like it feels good to feel good yeah. but I'm not compelled to do it oh yeah yeah it's yeah. it's it's so it's now become such an ingrained part of of my wellness I'm very mindful each day of like well how am I going to move today what does my day look like how am I going to incorporate movement into my day? So like if I'm going, if I'm camping or something like, I'm never going to think about training. Like anyone who goes camping, like you are up and down and moving and forgetting things and in and out of the tent or climbing in here and carrying things and da 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 Like yeah. you don't need to train anything. Like it's, <laughs> it's the most beautiful, like natural movement you project you can do. Just go camping. Just go, yeah. just go camping. Um, so yeah, I, I yeah. overtrain under eight. Uh-huh. And I had injuries that didn't heal. And I, and then guided by Jared and another friend of mine, Dr. Steve Ganjemi, um, I started to realize the connection between, and, and this, this again was a kind of paradigm shift where you think like, oh, this muscle in this joint is a problem in this muscle in this joint, where it's like, well, no, it's actually a nutrient deficiency in an organ mm-hmm. that's connected to that muscle group. So, and un- starting to understand actually what is happening to your biochemistry during menopause, understanding the estrogen roller coaster of like, like, every, like, no, it's declining, 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 declining. And then your body's like, one more roll of the dice. <laughs> and like, <laughs> it goes like, wait. And they're like, yeah, you feel good. And then like, oh my God, why do I feel so awful? And then, um, so understanding stress understanding that when you can't when you don't have the energy to meet the demands that life is placing on you it's going to bite you in the ass and there's no shortcuts there's no silver bullets so I started to train more gently but the biggest thing was changing my food so having breakfast within 30 minutes to one hour waking up cutting out caffeine I don't drink alcohol or I'll have like a glass or two of Prosecco if I'm celebrating something with a friend during the year um uh so identifying what were the stimulants and stresses that were like the easy red flags um I was having hot flushes I was having like sleepless nights where I'm like what the hell is happening to me like I've done all this stuff and like I'm you know i I presented well, but underneath there is this anxiety. Um, at one point, my ankles were so stiff. Um, it was painful to walk hmm. and I couldn't run. And that was just nutrient and mineral deficiencies and lifestyle stress. So I then based all my movement and my training around my capacity to recover, not the other way. So, and I, I wrote a whole blog about this of, of what is strong resting and what that means and really understanding that, you know, as we're going through our day, we're kind of just breaking down. <laughs> not, not mentally nervous breakdown, but on a kind of cellular, we, we're kind of breaking down in our, in our movement and, and in our, those kind of things. And yet, if you change, so, and then how we sleep is a product of how we've spent our day. So when I started to prioritize the rest and the sleep and the rebuild and the recovery, then that just fed into a positive up cycle rather than a negative down cycle. Um, I don't do any hormone replacement things. I don't do, the only supplements, I take magnesium and I take um, a mineral called uh, shilajit um, Mm -hmm. that I take. And I started eating more organ meat and organ meat makes yeah. me feel amazing. Yeah, <laughs> oh I'm a it's big organ meat things. fan. Yeah, like you think, weird. but I'm in Europe, so you know it's more normal here. <laughs> yeah, and you know I grew up like God for love nor money. You couldn't convince me to eat the liver on my plate, and now I'm like I told my mum I'm making liver pate every week. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah, and like, and it's one of those things where none of us know what normal feels like in anybody else. Mm-hmm. So I was a vegetarian for twenty years. Um, and then up until I think I was 42, 45, had injuries that weren't healing. Um, and this is just my story and I respect, you know, whatever anyone's kind of food choices are. Um, 
And for me, I, I then I went to a Chinese medicine lady and I didn't tell her anything. I was kind of like, oh, it's just like an MOT for your car. I was like, it's just, just like, I just wanted a, a, a kind of checkup. And within like a few minutes, she just looked at my ear and my tongue and she was like, what, you know, what do you eat? And I told her and she was like, you're empty. She was like, it's like grass. So, you know, like everyone has a reservoir kind of if we, we've had a very average, you know, balance your plate kind of upbringing. And um, she was like, you're, you're empty. Like, would you take medicine if you were sick? And I was like, well, yeah, if I was really sick, she was like, Food, food's medicine. Mm-hmm. And so I introduced shellfish and fish and immediately like I could not stop eating. Like every mm-hmm. meal had to have fish in it because my body just went like, oh, give me more, give me more, give me more. And then I did that for two years things started to improve and then I reintroduced meat and it was insane like within one month my strength had tripled and I did Mm. nothing else differently Mm. and um, so we need to kind of offset a lot of things as we age and as as the vet said to me yesterday about my dog she was like diet matters more as we age you know so there's there's never just one thing it's yeah. kind of like there are all these kind of pillars to health and um, all my movement stuff and the movement culture. It has to have a health first. That like that's the why behind it is health is freedom, health is happiness, health is autonomy, health is like oh you don't want to be a burden to other people as you age or you 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 actually just want to keep having adventures and doing life and and being joyful and number or, and for a lot of people it's just I don't want to be in pain. Yeah and unless you know like a piano dropped on you or you know unfortunately you know and I've been in a few car accidents um you know unless you have those kind of traumas and and there's a lot of different types of trauma um but for most of the people there is no reason why you can't be in your 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s and not be in pain yeah and it's, it's finding the right recipe and finding what works for you in your life so when someone says like, oh, well, what my, what, you know, what would someone's like movement snacks look like? It's like individual, mm-hmm. it's very individual. Like the amount of time that someone has, what they need, what their history is, what their story is, what is going to be, what is the sustainable thing that we can start doing? Because if it's not sustainable, you don't have accountability, you don't have continuity and you don't feel supported, change is really hard. And like change takes creativity, it takes courage. Otherwise, everyone would be changing and going like, because I mean, there's no shortage of information. Like it's, it's actually an overwhelm and confusion of information. And what may work for one person may not work for another. And so, you know, yeah. we all have our own story in midlife. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Really I don't even no, know. No, no, it is. It is. No, but you hit a lot of points there that were super important. And and it's interesting because you, from the very beginning, I, I felt that what you're trying to do to teach your clients and what you've learned yourself is listen to your body, right? One day you feel like moving yeah. differently than yeah. the other. And super important, especially as with women and our hormones and our fluctuations yeah. and stuff, super important. And it's interesting that you finally also got to figure out food right because you got yeah. the movement it took me, it took me, it took me like decades yeah decades. And then you dialed in and you felt yeah. you started to listen to your body what it needed yeah. uh despite whatever you know beliefs you had yeah. but you just said like, yeah. this my body needs this and that's yeah. really amazing so I love to hear that but what I I'm always impressed when I've heard that and so the first time I heard it from you is is that we don't need to live in pain. Like you, there's something, there's something you said here that was really interesting. I pulled it off of, I don't know where you said, I used to think it was normal that at midlife, there would be aches and pains to not have the same energy as in previous decades and to not realistically build strength, fully heal injuries and improve range of motion, mobility, flexibility, and stability. But now I call bullshit on that. It is Mm -hmm. not normal to have aches and pains be low energy and an emotional wreck just because you were 40 years old or or, or 40 years old or or over. Mm -hmm. And and I love this. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of pushing it. You know, I was living with aches and pains, nothing huge, but Mm -hmm. you know, just kind of ignore it, just push right through it. And so it's, hasn't really brought me a lot of limitations yet, but Mm -hmm. I'm curious when you say, 
well, wait a second, you know, can I get full range of motion? Can I, you know, get, you know, I was always trying to think, you know, well, this comes with a lifestyle. I'm a mover. So I'm going to have some mm-hmm. aches and pains and all that, but it's totally worth mm-hmm. it. But I want to find completely like a hundred percent. I want to be completely free because knowing, just knowing that I have some limitation in the range of motion of my hip, for example, mm-hmm. I've got hip mm-hmm. impingement, like, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but I would love to have a hundred percent range of motion rather mm-hmm. than 90 or 95 mm-hmm. or whatever it is. And how do you, how do you do this? How can we be pain-free and full of range of motion? Even so, if it's just not a big, I mean, even if it's not, a, if it's just a little, I imagine just a lot of people who have a lot of, of limitations and a lot of pain. Yeah. yeah. So it's baby steps. It's baby steps. And sometimes they're very long projects. Like I have a shitty narrow squat. Like it's just kind of like, and maybe that's my morphology. That's, I never grew up even sitting cross-legged. My mom used to sit with her like kind of knees to the side, like, uh, and that's kind of what I saw. I never, I never squatted as a kid, even sitting in school assembly in the morning, sitting cross-legged would, would be painful for me. So mm-hmm. I could kind of sit in my knees. So we we'll use it or lose it. So I'm, you know, reintroducing that. And now I can have like a wide squat and I can sit down in it. And that's amazing. Is it, is it a journey? Yes. Am I constantly giving, am I kind of checking in and, and doing that? And also sometimes we need to have body work as well. And what I mean by body work is some, it's like, it's never one thing with anything. So at one point I had um, Achilles tendonitis in, in both sides. I was wearing Nike Airs with personalized orthotics inside them. Like I was shod. I felt nothing underneath my feet. And that meant I didn't feel pain. And that was amazing. And then by chance, I was in London, like cycling down Labrador Grove. And I see my Tai Chi teacher from Devon from years ago. Like he's and like he's six foot seven, bold, really like stands out in a crowd kind of character. And I was like, Aaron, oh my God. Fast forward two hours later, we were in a park, catching up on life. He was training to be a rolfer. He gave me 30 minutes of rolfing. What's that? So rolfing is, um, so it's sometimes called structural integration and it manipulates and realigns the fascia in your body. So the connective tissue, which is like the, the web, the glue, which is underneath everything. He worked on the, my lower, on my calves, because there's actually very little fascia on the bottom of the feet. He worked on my calves and it, they were, he said the fascia was completely like locked and twisted in. And it feels like kind of a Chinese burn, like on your arm or on, on your skin. And um, I walked away barefoot pain-free. Wow. And then, and then from then I had to build up my foot strength and I had to build up my calf strength and my body strength. And I never, so now like I'm, I'm a big barefoot fan. I'm a big minimalist shoe fan. Because if your your feet are our kind of, they tell our body where we are. Yeah, if you have any heel toe, your body thinks you're falling. Your body doesn't feel safe. Like there's, there's I have a f- couple of like fun party tricks I do when I'm at workshops. And, and you can show people like the difference of when your heel's just a little bit up or when it's down, how your body responds to its, its own strength. So, um, so if I put my foot in a, a shoe, which has any arch support and any heel toe, my feet hurt and my knees hurt mm, because my body is not aligned. So like when you have an arch support that basically turns your, it's kind of like it's there for when your body's broken down. Yeah. So if you'd like been hiking a mountain for six hours and you're like, ah, oh, your, your foot would happily like collapse, but it, but it kind of turns it off. So when you put a, a healthy, strong foot inside something with an arch support, like my knees collapse in straight away. Hmm. So we have to start creating like, well, what's the right environment? So that was the right environment. So for me, I needed this external body work to help reset. So I'm a big fan of rolfing because fascia. And so we're, we're a biotensegrity network, which means so like a spider's web is a tensegrity network. If you if you pull at one bit, it's it's like tension and compression. If you if you ping one bit, it's going to affect everything else. Same in our body. Everything is connected. So um, 
So like when I do the movement set, someone's movement snacks for them, I always say to them like, oh, I get really excited if they go like, I, I can't, I couldn't do any of that. Like I couldn't even hold that for one second. Or, and I'm like, oh, this is amazing, amazing, cool, cool, cool. We, we found your treasure map because when you find what really challenges you and speaks to you, when you start to create change in that, you create change in everything. Nothing is separate. Nothing is isolated in the body ever. Like we, we you know, we're grown from a seed. No one said like, okay, now we're going to attach the bicep. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to put the glute on the edge of that. Like, oh, let's put the appendix in. Let's, let's add that one in now. Everything was grown together. Everything is connected on a physiological tissue cellular level. And then our mind and body is doing a constant dance as well. So we are this whole unit. So when you start to fix one tiny thing, you fix many, many, many things and then everything else. So things that are kind of, and you know, some, it, it, it's amazing. Sometimes people come to me and they'll be like, can I can show you my scans? I'm like, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> because what your body can do and work out is as miraculous and wonderful as neuroplasticity is and it's but it's also not to say like you know I'm not some crazy miracle worker and some people have like you know scaffolding inside their body like well I've got this metal plate here and my my foot doesn't move there or I have these bones things and that's fused there and that's there but can you create positive change I'm pretty convinced you always can but to wake up in the morning you shouldn't feel pain in your joints like my, I, my, I, li I feel like, I don't know, like I was when I was 15, like there's not, and that was not the same during perimenopause at mm. all and at the beginning of menopause. So I'm like, I'm not special. I don't do anything. I'm, I'm just doing the foundational good stuff all the time. Yeah. So you're attributing to it, um, good diet, lifestyle, good movement, finding those little techniques like the fascia, the roll thing, mm -hmm. or um, sleeping, having that, mm -hmm. you know, managing your stress, imagine all of this has been able to keep you pain free and mobile and happy, right? Without yes. any yeah. HRT. Yeah, yeah which is quite yeah. amazing, right? Yeah. And so for, for me, it was just never and maybe that's just a, a kind of you know, thing of how I kind of grew up as well of like, I remember my, I remember like, you know, taking a, a multivitamin or something when I was 20 and my dad looking at me like, what are you doing? Like <laughs> only really, really, really old people need to do that. Like if you're not getting <laughs> from enough things from your food, you're not eating the right food. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I do believe there's a, a soil issue here and especially in North America. When I moved from, from the UK to here, um, I would buy the same kind of quality like the same price range kind of food cook the same meals and my body changed yeah and I was like ah okay <laughs> yeah of course so, and and so not only that good. the food you know the way it grows and you're in yeah. LA a polluted city or you're in you know there's so many other factors that are yeah. coming in of what whether everything is is impacting you so it's not a surprise that you know things are off and it takes time to adapt yeah if you adapt at all. Right. So I, I want to ask, so we only have like 10 more minutes, but I just want to talk a little bit about your program because we would like to give people an idea what a typical day is when they work with you. I know that we also have, I mean, I've been doing the, the, the movement snacks, you got lots mm -hmm. of great stuff on, on YouTube and on your website. So we can do a lot of things for free, which I'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, well, I loved finding that you started with the breath work and mm -hmm. what I feel that, you know, I haven't gone through your program yet, but I, I have a feeling, you know, what you're doing is very similar to what I do when I teach people breath work. I don't tell mm -hmm. them, you know, take 10 minutes to do this. I tell them integrate it in your life. You should be breathing mm -hmm. like this all day long, every day. So, you know, if you try to anchor it to something and eventually you'll do more and more and more. And so I can see your movement snacks kind of like that, like the way you, you know, you crouch or bend or move, like we can integrate this when we're making the bed, when we're pulling the groceries out of the car, or, you know, a lot of these things are just, let's start you know, working on the ground, like instead of using a chair and a table, let's, you know, get on the floor and maybe use a coffee table or all this stuff. And it seems so very natural. And I'm kind of guessing 
that would be a, an approach, but maybe I'm wrong. How, how do you work with people? What, what do you do with them when they sign up yeah, to a 12-week I mean, program or something? Yes, I mean, you, you hit a, a lot of good things there that, that are all part of it. So I kind of outlined it as the MAPS system. So MAPS stands for, so movement snacks. So everybody has their own individualized um, movement program, which is kind of 10 minutes a day and they can sprinkle that throughout through like those 10 minutes, maybe one minute here and two minutes there or whatever. Or if there's someone who wants more, like I have some clients who like, no, give me more, like, or, the, or as they go through the program, they, they want more because movement begets more movement and then it feels good to feel good. And then you want to spend more time feeling good. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the movement snacks part of it. Then there's age positive. So which is the positive aging mindset. So I'm in constant kind of communication with my clients. So via WhatsApp and I get feedback on how they're doing with their movement snacks and how they are in their life. Because unless I kind of know what's happening in someone's life, how can I possibly program what I think is good for them? Maybe they're traveling for a few days or maybe they've had a big life event or maybe they're, you know, I had one client, Teresa, who um, she started working with me at the busiest time of her career. She was creating a massive event and she ended up doing more kind of workouts and training and more movement than she's ever done at the busiest time ever. Mm -hmm. So it's how, you know, I kind of program. So we're in contact a lot. So M is movement snacks. A is age positive mindset. P is the kind of play and parkour element. So um, during the week, there are kind of like movement snacks to do. And the weekends are very much more kind of activity, play, adventure challenges, um, community kind of things and then the s is for strong resting because like i said it's really the, the key in midlife is to reverse your mindset and plan everything you do around your capacity to recover because if you're not recovering you're you're breaking down and you're not getting the rebuild and repair and it's the rebuild and repair in midlife that is going to dictate the rest of life and sometimes when we, you know, I entered midlife with a car crash of <laughs> very menopause. But for me, I saw it as a gift. I saw it as this is a litmus test of where my baseline is actually at. So my nutrition was off. My training was off. Um, and a lot of my lifestyle was off. So now, like, uh, nature is the other thing that I haven't really mentioned, which is probably one of the most important things to me. Um, so every day I spend time in nature, around nature noticing things being there slowing down i love the stimulation of cities and activities and and you know that craziness as well but that's in the minority yeah. they're like some time in nature getting sunshine getting vitamin d so how someone goes through the program is individual to their life their needs their goals and their starting point um but there's a lot of feedback and so there's the, the there's the map system so the movement snacks are delivered on through the trainerize app and then we get feedback and communication and then i have a video curriculum where like i said i brought in all of my coaches and then um it's got the culmination of the best of everything i've learned in the last 15 years of what works what to be aware of and so it's really working out and these are like 10 to 20 minutes of videos to watch each week um so i cover everything from you know the emotional side of movement because a lot a lot of the reasons that people aren't moving is their their own mindset around it and understanding that movement is emotional and then when yet when people get emotional when they move they think there's something wrong with them or it's something bad because very few movement coaches talk about movement as an emotional process yet to move is is going to create some emotion whether it's joy fear disappointment anger frustration um all of these things it's um it's not always a well obviously you know if you moved you feel good or do you feel proud or do you feel a sense of identity so you know what is strong resting identifying what are the barriers to participation for you what's getting in the way how are you doing so um yeah like what someone's 12 week experience is as in individual as their life is. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 sorry, the generals are the, there will be movement, there will be breath work, there will be mindset, there will be an encouragement, support, and accountability each day. And resting. A lot of strong resting. Yeah, it sounds like you've done one of St Dr. Stacy Sims' programs. Uh, I've not. You, you no. haven't? No, no, no. I mean, I know her it. name through um, 
Celine. Celine's group. Um, but I, I haven't read any of her books. Or, and, and it's funny, when I talked to Celine, she was like, oh, or, and I think you said as well, like, she's a big advocate for the kind of rest and recovery. And the reason I say strong resting is that so many people I know have this outdated um, mindset and thinking that to rest is lazy, to rest is not productive, to rest is being weak. To, and I'm just like, like some days I'm like, oh man, I was strong resting so hard. So I was, I was at an event last week. I was off grid camping for five days and I came back and I was like, oh man, I'm going to strong rest the hell out of these next few days. It's going to be amazing. And like, so now I feel, I feel great. Like I'm all like, yay, back to the gym. Yeah, no, that's why it sounds, it sounds very much like you've done one of her programs because she's very, very much about a lot of things that you've, you've mentioned. So cool. I was just curious so tell me then what does a woman over 50 generally like what is what do they come to you with what's their problem and and how do you you help them and I know it's very individual but is there any kind of trends that you're seeing yeah people are lacking energy they have pain somewhere in their body they're not as strong as they used to be able to be and they're worried that they can't that they're not going to be able to kind of keep up Mm. and so with with whether it's like their kids the rest of the family um and they don't want to accept that that this is it that there's there's no way that they can feel you know like to wake up pain-free to wake up with energy to to make progress and also a lot of people just they're worried that what they're doing isn't the right thing that's going to give them continuity to keep doing the thing that they love A lot of people aren't like very concerned about, you know, there aren't sort of performance goals. A few people have them and we generally like hit those very, very early in the course. Um, And a lot of people um, hit a lot of PBs without us doing those things. So they'll have a a trainer in London, Georgina, and she's, my God, she's, she just, she started getting like PBs in her, her bench press, her deadlift. Uh, Another client, Tammy, um, on day 11, she got this, elbow pop-up move that she wanted to get for six months and it's not to say that the thing that I've given them is a rebalance in their body for their recovery and their body is now more connected and um, able to do that thing that they were getting in the way of doing so although we don't train anyone's bench press although we weren't uh, we were never training the elbow pop-up I create help them create their environment for them to utilize to be the best that they they could to have access to what they were capable of so tammy sent me this message yesterday saying like i think i'm going to call you and she's only five weeks and she said i think i'm going to call you describe your course as she said um eat more do less get stronger and be happy i was like <laughs> yeah i'll take it that sounds really <laughs> no. good that sounds yeah. awesome so, so yeah a lot of people are just missing that aren't able to connect the dots with a lot of things and there's a lot of people coming out of the pandemic who are still stuck in that um, tense vigilant tired and wired and they think they're doing fine because they're doing a bit better than they were but they're still not in a place of ease they, they don't have energy like at the end of the day or they're kind of short and impatient with their partner um or they just they've they've kind of given up on thinking that they'll get stronger yeah and and Mm -hmm. they're and a lot of the times they're people who don't have anyone else to play with like they don't they don't have their movement tribe of people who want to go and like get really excited by a tree that they want to go and hang from or do that stuff and they're people who like some of the people I train go to gyms as well and some people don't some people have their strength training program and movement snacks kind of runs alongside them. Um, but yeah, range, range of motion is a big thing. Pain is a big thing, energy. And people want confidence to know that what they're doing, they want something that's going to sustain them, that they can have continuity with, so they can keep doing the thing they love for longer. Super. I love it. And I definitely, I think most of us listening want to want the same. I mean, who wouldn't want that? And, and we have to disrupt these ageist stereotypes of, you know, oh, well, I'm just getting older. Oh, you know, that's normal. No, it's not normal. I'm totally hundred percent with you on that. I'm going to have to let you go, but I want to tell people that you can get the, the free introductory course. I'll have that in the show notes. And you also have a, um, 
uh, movement snacks for runners. That was something new that you also yeah, yeah, just excited. So one of the big things about movement snacks is that I want people to be 360 degrees strong. And for people who are doing a lot of the same linear motion all the time, they're the people who they'll put their back out, lifting the dog food out the back of the car. Mm-hmm. Um, so I believe being 360 degrees strong is what creates that connected body as well. Absolutely. And you've got a great course the your physical strength, 90 day reset, and I've got all your contact, the cdo.com website. Yeah, you're on Facebook, Instagram, you got a Facebook group, so much stuff to, to find out where you are and how to reach you. What, what is there any last words that you'd like to tell women over 50 um, before I let you go? Yeah, don't settle for less. Don't settle for it. Like this is, this is the, the beginning of the next chapter and it can be your strongest, healthiest, happiest, and pain is a request for change. Love it. Oh gosh. Yeah. This is absolutely the mindset of, um, so Celine Yeager and Dr. Stacy Sims. This is why I love that menopause group and you're just a part of it without even realizing it. So what an inspiration. No, you are very, very inspirational and and helping us disrupt those, those stereotypes. So we can age better and stronger. Don't no doubt about. So thank you so much, Julie. I hope to have you on again, and I'm going to be doing more of your movement snacks as we go along. Pleasure. Thank you. And I'm running a a four day challenge starting in 10 days time. So anyone can join up and join me or message me and I'll go through the whole map system. And um, yeah, what's the date then the the first Uh, second of May, second Monday, the second of May. Um, so yeah, every, all the details are on julieangel.com. Oh no, they're not actually, but you can find me, they will be, but uh, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and I'll be posting about that. 